I'm Assemblymember Joanne Simon. So I would like to thank our sponsors of the day, first off, and that is Eye to Eye, uh, Bridge Prep Charter School, who has been here before, we love Bridge Prep, Decoding Dyslexia, the Literacy Academy Collective, Churchill School and Center, Mary McDowell Friends School, Literacy, uh, we have the Literacy Academy Collective twice, so they're so good, we mentioned them twice, Advocates for Children, uh, the Education Council Consortium, uh, Senator Zellner Myrie, Senator Robert Jackson, I know I saw Senator Jackson here, um, uh, Senator Hoyleman Siegel, Assemblymember Robert Carroll, and Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. And they will all, uh, those uh, electeds, the hosts will say a, a few words in a, in a moment. Um, and I also want to very much thank um, our New York State Commissioner of Education, Betty Rosa. Um, thank you. People may not realize, but for many years now, at least five, um, probably longer, uh, people from the New York State Department of Education have come to Dyslexia Awareness Day and participated, observed, and listened to the stories and listened to the conversations. Um, and they've been taking that information back. And it is sometimes a slower process than we'd like, but there is actually a lot of work that's doing. And we have made a difference. You have made a difference um, in uh, educating and uh, really communicating uh, how much work needs to be done uh, in our educational system. And uh, Dr. Rosa has come uh, numerous times, and she's going to say a few words about what they're doing now. Uh, but as you know, she's the Commissioner of Education, and she's president of the state, the University of the State of New York. So that's like a lot of stuff that she's responsible for. And she's the first Latina woman to serve in that position. And um, she was chancellor of our Board of Regents, you may recall. And then COVID hit. And our Commissioner of Education left, not because of COVID, but left. It just happened to kind of coincide. And she knew that the State Department of Education needed strong leadership. And so she left her position as chancellor and became the state education commissioner when we needed her most. She has an extensive background in education as a teacher, a principal, a superintendent. She's a special educator. Um, she comes to us with a wealth of experience and a wealth of judgment about the situation and knowledge of the systems. Sometimes our systems need to be goosed. Sometimes our systems need to improve. And how you improve systems is, a, is sometimes a very different uh, than improving our school. But we're so blessed we have people here today who are teachers, people who are a principal, who is really working on bringing the science of reading and balanced literacy to their schools. And it starts that way because we will show success and people love it when they see success and then we're better able to communicate that message. So I'm very delighted to introduce our Commissioner of Education, Dr. Betty Rosa. Thank you. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Simon. Um, not only for the introduction, but for your wisdom, for your talent, and guiding this work. We're really so appreciative of everything you do, along with many of your team. I, I wanna start by saying that um, many of these issues really come to light because of champions, people who lead the way. And um, obviously the assembly woman not only leads the way, but she truly, truly passionately um, makes sure that we are, um, that she gives voice and that we are aware of all of this great work um, that is going on, but also when she talked about you know, the, the issue of the science of reading is really, really narrowing it down to including all students, but specifically um, this annual dyslexia awareness is exactly doing this, not only creating an awareness, but also calling to action the work that needs to be done. So for that, I'm extremely grateful. So I wanna say good morning again uh, most of you know that New York has, has been by law 
uh, a local control state. And I know I say this constantly, and this is one of the big challenges we face, which is that curriculum decisions are at the local school board and district level, which is why we have to continue to do this work, which I call at the, at the state level, there's a role to be played, but there is nothing more important than at your local level making sure that your voices are heard at the local level. We know that students with dyslexia are too often, often experiencing reading instruction that just isn't working for them. We know that. But what we have to answer is the question, how can we provide excellent reading instruction that helps students with dyslexia? Our job is to teach all students and all means all. The department has developed learning standards, and one of the things that we're currently doing, particularly in the early learning and literacy space, is to articulate these expectations. I want to say that again. We want to articulate these expectations in terms of our school districts and our schools. My background is special education. I've worked in that space prior to joining the ranks of Gen Ed. And it really truly informed, as well as my doctoral dissertation, uh, cooperative teaching in the inclusive classroom. We also want to make sure that our children are very much a part of the inclusive classroom. This dichotomy exists for a reason. We know that not one size fits all, and therefore, we have to make sure that we give voice to this issue. Most of you know that districts are able to create and adopt curricula, but we have to make sure as they, they enter into this, these conversations that they do. As I know, I had a wonderful conversation because I have visited Bridge Prep, and not only that, we had what I would call a teachable uh, conversation. I know um, that the, the director, the principal, the, I call him the superintendent for that space, was very, very welcoming. Uh, I had opportunity to visit the school, to sit with the teachers, but more importantly, to engage about the work of foundation, building that foundation at an early stage and building from the foundation to ensure uh, that that work continues. But the other thing that he has done is to share his learning, to share his tools to help others build their, uh, build their homes. Um, all of us know that International Dyslexia Association looks at the best practices of phonological awareness and phonics and decoding. We know that there are three principles for students with dyslexia. S uh, systemic decoding, explicit diagnostic. And let me just say, we have to start with diagnostic. We have to look in and know what are we working for and what are we working towards. As a former teacher and superintendent, I know that in order to subscribe to the issue of all means all, is that we have to make sure that all students are successful. We know that reading is foundational skill and that we have to address uh, this issue. We know that there are uh, multi-sensory approaches such as Orton-Gillingham, which really create opportunities for systemic phonics-based uh, and specific type of reading instruction. And I can go on and on about the different approaches that we need to target, but the, the most important message I will leave you with this morning is that the earlier we begin this work in terms of language-based learning, the earlier that we focus on early identification and early intervention and identify the specific supports and make the investments we must be, we must provide targeted assistance and also know that structured literacy focused on intentional work is critical and we commit 
our department commits to doing this work, not only in terms of teacher training at the higher ed level, but also at the local level, providing resources, providing support, providing the kind of leadership that's needed to identify not only the best practices in terms of what we know as the science of reading, but focusing on early intervention and knowing that our students need the kind of support in order to succeed and be members of this contributing society. And I am so proud of all the advocates and all the individuals that are here today giving voice to this issue because without your support and without your voice, in many ways, our children would not receive the very, very best that they're entitled to. And with that, I thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Hi, mic check. Is this mic better or is the other mic better? Okay, so mic number one. Mic number one? Yes, no? It was on. The red light, green light has to be on. So can you hear this better or, oh, Susanna? Shall we just talk more into okay, the microphone great. that works for you? Great, yeah. super, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you to Commissioner Rosa for your remarks. Um, it's, uh, it, it's good to have uh, the State Department of Education uh, working in partnership uh, with us. So, um, and it, it, it's going to, you know, we're all frustrated. It's not going to turn around overnight, but um, we do have people really trying to, to change, the, change this. Um, so now I'm going to ask uh, some of my colleagues who are co-hosting this event, Senator Jackson, who has been an incredible leader in education and in uh, working with uh, kids with dyslexia and is my partner on a number of important bills, including the one that would change the way we are actually educating our teachers in our colleges of education so we stop graduating people who don't understand how to teach reading. So thank you, Senator Jackson. Thank you. Good morning. Well, let me thank you, my sister. You are uh, the type of leader that we need to have up here in Albany to make the changes that we need to make. So congratulations to you, and let me give her applause. <laughs> and obviously, we have many advocates fighting right now and here today. You know, the, uh, Betty Rosa has been on the front line uh, for many, many years working in order to improve the education outcomes of all of our children. And Betty, thank you for your leadership. <laughs> and of course, where's Bobby Carroll? Bobby Carroll is here. He has been a fighter for everyone, someone uh, that uh, was dyslexic or maybe continued dyslexic, fighting to make sure that people get the assistance and the help that they need in order to make sure that they will be successful in life. And I say that to you, and I thank Joanne Simon for her steadfast leadership, making sure that we all do better to support students and families with dyslexia. And for me personally, my daughter, Asmahan, who's 42, I remember when she was at school, PSIS 187 in Washington Heights, and she was not performing at the level that we thought she should be performing. We had her tested, and uh, the, the doctor said uh, she's a normal child. Everyone is different. Now, mind you, I was a, 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 a person that was 20-something years old and taking our daughter to be tested. And then we even took her to the Department of Education in the school to have them evaluate her. And they said, no, she's a normal child. But she was not performing at the level that we thought she should be performing. And even now, at 42 years of age, with uh, two master's degree, and she coordinates a, a school district in Virginia for, as the math coordinator, after being an assistant principal, she loves math, she realizes that she had some issues and concerns in learning. And in my opinion, our opinion, it was because she was dyslexic. And so, but parents try to do everything they can to make sure their kids get a good education. I know that because I've seen it uh, in staff that I have, I've seen it in friends that I know that have children that do everything they can in their power 
to give their children what they need. So let me just thank all of those that are fighting to give our children the appropriate education they rightfully deserve. So dyslexia affects millions of people worldwide, impacting the ability to read, write, and comprehend texts. Around 15 to 20% of the global population has some form of dyslexia, making it one of the most common languages uh, differences. Despite its prevalence around the world, dyslexia is often misunderstood and stigmatized, leading to a lack of support and resources for those affected. Designating a day to uplift dyslexia, we take a step forward in recognizing the unique strength and potential of individuals with dyslexia. And I know that because I've seen the difference that it makes. And you, you know, you, you grow leaders based on their knowledge and support. It is an opportunity to educate ourselves and the broader community about the nature of dyslexia and the support needed to empower the community. And I've said even today, one individual, the mayor of New York City, we have different opinions about him, but he's said from day one that we have to deal with dyslexia for our children. And that's a good thing because recognition of the issues and concerns that impact our families is extremely important. So by investing in early identification and appropriate interventions, we ensure that individuals with dyslexia receive the necessary tools that they need to accommodate, to thrive in an academic and in the daily life. But we also need to be proactive as a state, New York State, the Empire State. Well, let's act like it. <clears throat> Supporting students with experience in dyslexia from the very beginning. And we have to prepare our teaching workforce to teach our students how to read phonetically. And we must do this at a higher education level, and that's what our bill is talking about. Even Joanna Garcia, the woman in the uh, yellow shirt back there, we were in the city council trying to push that back then. So we have to keep pushing to make people realize that this is an issue and concern for many of us, not just a few of us. So, but we must do this at a higher education level Moreover, it is crucial to promote a positive and inclusive environment that encourages dyslexic individuals to embrace their strengths, their talents, and their limitless potential. The Dyslexia Awareness Day resolution is an important step in this process. Dyslexia Awareness Day serves as a reminder that our society is enriched by the diversity of members, including those with dyslexia. It encourages us to challenge the misconceptions and stereotypes, fostering an atmosphere of acceptance <clears throat> and support. And through understanding, empathy, and targeted efforts, we can create a world where individuals with learning differences are empowered to reach their goals and contribute their unique perspective to society. And by supporting Dyslexia Awareness Day resolution, we commit ourselves to furthering our understanding, spreading awareness, and championing the rights of those with dyslexia to receive the support and resources they need to reach their full goal. Parante, palante, you know what that means. Let's go forward, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator. Hit the button again. Sorry, I hit the, the off button. Uh, I'm going to ask another one of our uh, Dyslexia Awareness Day uh, co-sponsors, and that is um, Assemblymember Harvey Epstein from the Lower East Side. Thank you, uh, thank you Joanne, and thank you for every year really highlighting the issues of dyslexia. Um, you know, as uh, I'm dyslexic, I had a problem growing up. I couldn't, I couldn't read. I did reversals, and I still do. So. Um, it sticks with you through, through your life, but it's so important to talk about this, talk, so important to demystify it, so important to get people the support they need as early in life as possible. As Joanne and all of us continue to say, you know, if we look at people who are in our prison system, disproportionate number of people who are incarcerated have dyslexia. If we treat people and test people earlier, as our friend and colleague Bobby Carroll keeps talking about, we can make a difference for everyone's life. 
So it's really important to talk about it here. It's important to talk about it in the context of the budget. It's important to continue to talk about it. I mean, with the state education department has an amazing champion with Betty Rosa, who's been like a fierce advocate for us all. So Betty, thank you for everything that you do for the state of New York and for all our young people. And we will continue to, to fight together. Whether it's in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or post, people need support. It is our responsibility to make sure that happens, and exactly what days like today are supposed to be. So thank you again, Joanne. Thank you for all your work, and I hope everyone enjoys this really wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. And now, uh, Assemblymember Bobby Carroll, are you here? You're next. Thank you so much, Joanne, and good morning. You know, it is really wonderful to be here with all of you, and I want, you know, I want to say thank you to, you know, all of the young boys and girls who came up today to talk about their struggles, because I struggled with dyslexia, and let me tell you, I would have never been as brave as all of you to come up here and advocate not just for yourselves, but so many other people who are in your same shoes. Because what is happening right now in our public school system is discrimination and it is illegal. Let me say that again. It is discrimination and it is illegal. I don't care about local control. What is going on is discrimination and illegal. It needs to stop. We know how to stop it. We know what to do for children with dyslexia. I have two moms here who were in my office last week, who've come up. Right now, both of their children are in New York City public schools in different neighborhoods. Right now, they are fighting with New York City DOE to get their children the mandated services that they are entitled to, and they are being denied. That is a violation of a civil rights law. So if you want to stand up and say you care about children, you care about civil rights. You would have marched on Washington if you were there in 1963, and you think it's OK to deny a child a right to read. Then you're no champion of children or education. I stand here for two reasons, and two reasons alone. My mother, who back in 1992 fought to get me an appropriate education. And the reason she knew how to fight was because she had an honest teacher, I had an honest teacher, at PS 230. Didn't lie to me, didn't lie to my parents. Told it to my parents straight. Your son can't read. This doesn't make sense. I got a hunch. I bet he's dyslexic. And then there was privilege. My parents had the means and the opportunity to bring me to Columbia University Medical School and get me a neuropsych. And then there were a bunch of fantastic educators at the Gateway School, a school started in 1974 by a bunch of moms in a church uh, office building on 74th Street and Madison Avenue. And they said, we can do better for our children, and we will. And it's because of those people that I'm here today. The sad thing is, that was 30 years ago, and we are in the exact same place. I have a seven and a half month old. If my son struggles with dyslexia, which is very likely, I will have to do the exact same thing that my mother did for me if we do not change. I am really happy that we have finally have leaders, and I commend Mayor Adams and Chancellor Banks specifically that are waking up to the issues of structured literacy and the five pillars of literacy and understanding that is necessary for all students to learn how to read. But if we do not, if we do not get serious about this issue and specifically about the violation of the civil rights of children with dyslexia that goes on in every single one of our school districts, we cannot claim to be champions of anyone or anything because these children are suffering. There is no reason for their suffering. We know how to diagnose. We know how to remediate. The question is, do we have the will? Because it will take a lot of work. It will take a lot of training. And guess what? It will take a lot of money. 
And if you think you don't want to do the work or you don't want to spend the money, fine. Then be honest about it. Because every one of these children can read. Every one of these children can flourish academically. Let's not allow the soft bigotry of low expectations that fall upon so many dyslexic children every single day. So I want to thank you. Because I would not have been brave enough to come here when I was eight or nine years old. I was ashamed. I was upset. I was vulnerable. I was segregated. But I am not anymore. And I promise you, I will stand shoulder to shoulder with all of you, with all of your sons and daughters, to make sure this doesn't happen again to any other kid. But I will not give cover to any single elected official or anyone else who suggests that this problem is just too tough or we've got to worry about what localities think because it is discrimination. We wouldn't allow a local school district to uh, teach creationism. We shouldn't allow them to teach bunk reading. We wouldn't allow... We shouldn't allow school districts to lie to parents. We shouldn't allow school districts to ostracize children. And we know that if we continue that, they will inherit the wind. We have a phenomenal state. We have a phenomenal education system. It's us who are going to decide how that happens. It's us who are going to decide the direction of our schools. We need to do that now. We've got a bill that just passed the New York State Assembly and Senate unanimously to have a task force for your stories, your stories, to come out and explain what is going on in your local schools, what's happening to your children. The governor callously vetoed it last year, said it cost too much money. That was a lie. She didn't want to hear your stories. Make your voices loud and clear that you want the governor to hear your stories from Buffalo to Brooklyn. Please sign our petition. Make sure it gets signed. Be loud. Be strident. Not just your children deserve it. Every single child who's struggling to learn how to read deserves it. We can fix this problem. It's if we have the will. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assemblymember Carroll. Um, you know, in 1993, I filed the first case representing a person with dyslexia who was denied accommodations on the New York State Bar Exam because they couldn't believe that she had dyslexia because she was too smart. She was too capable. She was too educated. We are still fighting that battle in many respects. The uh, world of discrimination hasn't changed. It's a civil rights violation. It's a special education law violation. And too many of our school districts have taken the child find principle and made it let's not find children. Um, and so this is a constant battle. I'm talking with some of my colleagues. We're starting a, um, uh, an informal special ed caucus here because we know that special ed has been the stepchild of education for, for far too long. And we need to start working together uh, to improve that picture. Um, and uh, we will do that by working together. It does take a village, as somebody famous once said. And um, that is why you're all here. That is why we're all working together. And we all have sometimes different roles to play. But we're all in this together, and we're all fighting for the same goal. Um, so very quickly, uh, I have a, a new member, and then I'll introduce Brad. And then we're going to have to move on to our, our panel. Um, Jake Blumenkrantz is just recently elected from Long Island. He has a story. He's going to talk for no more than a minute because everybody else has defied my instructions to speak for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to tell my story and my experiences with dyslexia. Uh, it started when I was in kindergarten. Like many of you, uh, it's early detection. My elementary school teacher held up my homework and showed it to my parents and showed that she had to grade it uh, in the mirror because it was all backwards. And uh, I, I powered through and struggled with dyslexia and dysgraphia and dyscalculia through my entire educational journey. And it really is one of the greatest struggles anyone in their educational journey will face. Um, but a common uh, issue and theme I've seen and my greatest accomplishment was achieving my higher education goals that I always wanted when I didn't even know if I would be able to read proficiently or not. And it came with um, a lot of will and support. It was understanding what structure to build around your educational journey and then when to kick off the support 
and achieve uh, educational independence, to be able to go to college, go to grad school, go to law school, and, and focus on what your neurodivergence makes you so strong at. Finding your strengths, finding your passion. Mine was history, then it was policy. Um, and I, I knew I was going to be in a room like this. Uh, I am one of the youngest people here today in the state legislature. Uh, I, I powered through my educational journey and I fought for my independence after I fought for my support. And understanding that the journey doesn't end in elementary school, it doesn't end in middle school, it doesn't end in high school. It's, it's overcoming every next hurdle. And that is what I am most proud of. Um, it's, it's getting through the entire educational journey and it truly takes supportive parents, understanding teachers, and a government that understands that individualized learning is what helps us all achieve equal education. So I want to thank the, the sponsors and co-sponsors, and I'm so excited to become a part of uh, the, the process and uh, the event, and I look forward to meeting so many of you. Thank you so much. Do you have a few minutes? Okay, or can I put on mic? Yeah, okay. So. Um, the chair of our education committee, uh, assembly member Mike Benedetto is here. He's gonna say a few words. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here up in Albany today. I'll make this very quick. Listen, the importance of you being up here is, is, is a no-brainer. It is the work you're doing, the attention you're doing. Um, is so important. I believe that we have entered upon a new era in dealing with dyslexia. For the first time, I believe the the um, everything is converging, and things are beginning to happen statewide. It takes a little time, as you all know. And it is because of your efforts in advocating for better, work, uh, better laws, better studies, um, 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 better testing for dyslexia. But where we are right now could never have happened five years ago. We are at a point, because of your efforts, where things are now beginning to happen. Okay, and when I say that, I mean looking towards actually doing studies and creating some sort of a pathway for best practices in dealing with dyslexia. I'm talking about early testing for dyslexia, and ongoing text, uh, um, testing for dyslexia. We're not there yet but we're a long way down the road that you people have started on, okay? I'm committed to f continuing on that road, to dealing with the problem of dyslexia that we see in our society, and dealing with our children so they can grow up learning how to read, learning how to be productive members of society, society and dealing with the dyslexia and dealing with the problems they have. It's been done before. We have great advocates here. Besides you guys, we have great advocates in the legislature, beginning with Ms. Simon and Bobby Carroll, okay, and Senator Brad um, Holloman. Uh, um, these people are here. They're doing the work, they continue to do the work. Sometimes it's frustrating, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to move these bills along and these studies along, okay? We keep trying, we keep doing because we know what, we, what you are fighting for is the right thing and we'll eventually achieve our goal. Thank you for coming here today. Come back again next year and so we can continue the fight, and we will continue the fight in the meantime. Thank you very much for being here. Jo Joanne, thank you for doing it. Thank you, Assemblymember. Thank you, Assemblymember uh, Benedetto. 
And now uh, our Senator Brad uh, Siegel, Hoylman, Hoylman Siegel, which is it now? Sorry, he made a change. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Assembly. Let's give a round of applause for Assembly Member Simon for organizing today. You know, it's so great to have a colleague like Joanne who really understands the issue from the legal and the practitioner standpoint. That's why she's such a champion, and I want to thank her personally, because I have a 12-year-old daughter, which is what is the origin of my policy interest in dyslexia. We didn't know she was dyslexic till she was in fourth grade because, as the chancellor knows, we have no statewide screening. So nobody knows. I literally was at a public hearing with Assemblymember Carroll talking to him about my daughter's lack of proficiency in reading. Without missing a beat, Assemblymember Carroll said, I think she's dyslexic. I gave him this like ghastly expression. He held my hand and he said, it's okay, she's not gonna die. <laughs> and as a parent, you're just bombarded with information and misinformation, but we are working in Albany with SED to try to make it easier for parents. We have legislation to have insurance providers cover your neuropsychological exams. We put out $7,000 for ours, and most parents can't do that. We paid for our daughter to go to a specialized school in dyslexia, the Windward School. Most parents can't do that. We got our daughter screened years later. Most parents don't know, which is why there are so many incarcerated men who have dyslexia and never knew. So I just want to thank the assembly member, the chair of the Assembly Education Committee, Bobby Carroll, who quite frankly saved our daughter's life, uh, a lifetime of reading, and thank you for being here and advocating for these important issues. Thank you, Assemblymember.